So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining uh, this uh, session six of the Future Founders Program, which is a 10-week program uh, that we launched earlier in this year to help give potential founders in the open technology space uh, more insight into, into some of the areas that they might find helpful when it comes to starting a, a new business. My name is Matt Barker. I'm the entrepreneur in residence for Open UK. Uh, open UK is the, op the UK organization for open technology so that covers open source software, hardware, and open data. And um, I actually started my own open source business uh, it's coming on seven or eight years now in the Kubernetes space uh, and uh, really uh, was trying to help companies to get value out of Kubernetes and in the process created a number of successful open source projects of my own, one of which is called Cert Manager, which some of you might be aware of. Every session that we're hosting is led by a subject matter expert um, and various founders in the open source space. And this one that we're going to talk about today is about raising money in uh, open technology versus the proprietary world, where you might want to go to get some help in, in, in raising around open technology and some of the issues that you might be able to avoid. We also run a mentorship program in, in, in alignment with the series, and we're looking for people to join that. So please do get in, get, get in contact with me via the openuk.uk forward slash founders forum um, site. We've got some amazing panelists today uh, joining us. Uh, first and foremost, we have Adrian Collier, who's the venture partner at Accel Partners. Adrian joined Accel in 2015, has been involved in open source infrastructure companies for more than 20 years. He was a CTO at Spring Source. Uh, and joined VMware and, and Pivotal. He is a venture, as a venture partner, Adrian works with software-based companies across Europe. He's a board member or observer for Sneak, Skipjack, and Weaveworks, which is obviously the well-known Kubernetes company based out of London. Adrian is from London. He writes the morning paper, a CS blog, reviewing a mix of the latest research and foundational papers in computer science. Thanks for joining us, Adrian. My pleasure, great to be here, thank you. Next, we have Henry Nash. Henry's the CTO in developer advocacy at Hybrid Cloud at IBM. So he's been a core contributor to a number of open source projects over the years, for example, OpenStack Keystone. He's a long history in the creation of enterprise software and breakthrough emerging technology, having founded five venture-backed startup companies in Europe and the USA, finally coming to IBM via acquisition in 2009. Among the awards these companies have received are both the Queen's Award for Technology and the Queen's Award for Export. He holds a first class honours degree in electrical engineering from the University of Southampton in the UK. Welcome, Henry. Delighted to be here. Thanks. We also have Leanne Kemp. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Everledger. And in her role as CEO, she inspires and steers the team of Everlegends to increase transparency and trust with technology in close collaboration with industry partners. She's a prominent figure in the technology sector. She co-chairs the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the Future of Manufacturing and takes part in the Global Future Council on Blockchain. She also leads work streams at the Global Blockchain Business Council, co-chairs the World Trade Board's Sustainable Trade Action Group and is on the IBM Blockchain Platform Board of Advisors. She's won an unbelievable number of awards, which uh, I think would take too long to, uh, to list them all out. But she, the success uh, in her entrepreneurialism led her to become the Queensland Chief Entrepreneur in Australia to develop the state startup ecosystem, attract investment and support job creation. And she was the first female entrepreneur to hold this position. More recently, Leanne has been appointed to the Global Blockchain Business Council as a regional ambassador of Australia, an adjunct professor in the Institute for Future Environment at the Queensland University of Technology and Blockchain, advisory board member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. Wow, Leanne, I don't know how you have time for, <laughs> for anything outside oh, that. I need that summary from my Tinder profile. I need, to, <laughs> I need you to send it to me. Big welcome to you, Leanne. Thanks for joining us. And then by no means, uh, uh, last but by no means least, we have Sam Weaver. He's the CEO of Plural Labs. Uh, a good friend of mine, Sam is uh, CEO of Plural Labs, which is a venture-backed startup that empowers DevOps teams to effortlessly deploy and operate production-ready open source applications from day one. Sam has spent over a decade in open source, having held engineering, architect, and product management roles at Red Hat and MongoDB. Most recently, Sam was head of product on Cork, the no-code enterprise application platform. And Sam has actually been on one of these panels before. So thank you for joining uh, for a second time in a, in a row, Sam. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. I had a lot of fun in the last one. So great to be back. Thanks for having me. Cool. So we'll kick off. Um, if anyone has any questions in the background, please feel free to, to, to post them in the chat or send them to me directly. But we're talking today around founder experience raising and runway in open tech. I thought just to, to kick things off, it'd be great if we could just go around the, um, 
the room, as it were, and find out a little bit about how participants actually got into open technology and perhaps where they are in their journey with uh, with uh, with raising. So, Leanne, do, would you would you mind maybe going to you, Leanne? Yeah, sure. So, look, I'm 25 years veteran in the making as a software engineer, and my recent adventure, which is Everledger, is um, uh, enabling blockchain technology to be able to track some of the most opaque supply chains in the world, starting from diamonds right the way through to um, fashion brands and critical minerals and even electric vehicle batteries. Um, you know, the where really blockchain in its core element is an open source uh, series of protocols and platforms. And so we're building applications on top of that as a source. Um, this venture or adventure um, or misadventure has raised about $30 million in our Series A with lead investors of Bloomberg, Fidelity, Tencent and Rakuten. Um, and we've got about six operational centres around the world um, as and about 110 staff today. Amazing. Wow. That's uh, that's quite an achievement to raise so much from such a, a great list of, um, of backers. Um, let's move on to Sam. Do you want to quickly talk about how you got into open source and where you are on your journey with uh, with, with investment? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, my background is computer science. Uh, pretty quickly realized if I was going to do any development work, it was going to be typically on something like a Linux system. Moved into IBM, was working on mainframes. And I had a friend actually at the time working at Red Hat. He said, you should come, come check out what Red Hat's doing. I went, had a look. I mean, it was awesome. Just the company was awesome. The product was great. I love the principle of open source and um, joined Red Hat, spent four years there learning a lot about open source software. Uh, two as an engineer, two as an architect, moved to product and uh, went to MongoDB. And I spent six and a half years at MongoDB then. And, um, and so now I'm the CEO of Plural. Um, Plural's open source, and we have raised a seed round. So um, actually today it will get announced. Uh, so I'm going to give a little exclusive here before the, the news breaks, but we just raised um, all in a, a pre-seed and a seed round is a $7 million raise for us. And so we're excited about uh, what that means and being able to go and grow the business and, and hire the team, etc. So yeah, looking forward to talking more about that and uh, our perspective on why we raised and how we raised. Well, big congratulations on that. And obviously, given you've literally just gone through it, I'm hoping you'll be able to bring some really great, some great perspective and insight on that. Uh, Henry. Uh, yeah, so uh, as you said in your kind intro, I've done a whole bunch of startups um, here in the Valley and so forth. Um, actually, most of them were probably more closed source than open source. So they got involved in open source primarily through OpenStack as a core maintainer there. And really motivated by the fact of community and um, the ability to you commit code and someone's using it in an hour's time. I mean, that's just like unheard of from the way traditional software is developed. Um, and that was incredibly powerful as far as I was concerned. Uh, my current role, uh, as, as you said, by I'm at IBM because they acquired the last startup, um, is where I actually go and work with a whole bunch of growing ISV startups, open source as well as closed source, about how do we do a better job as corporates to actually, um, you know, work with them, gain, you know, benefit from their technology, have partnerships? Because most large companies will admit that that's tough, you know, because you know it's just a scale problem and a size problem. And so that's so why all my time at IBM is, you know, working with the ISV community about how can we IBM and our clients do a better job at integrating and, and using and partnering with small growing startups. So. I've got kind of both ends of the view here, which is yeah, pretty motivating. Both ends of the view and obviously probably get quite a privileged position to sort of see how the ecosystems come together and, and sort of like the trends that are the well, <laughs> We want to hear about those as well. So maybe we can we can yep, I think the, the ones that don't work are, are probably more important than the ones that do in some respects. So exactly. People don't do that. Yeah. Well, th thanks, Henry, for that. And Adrian. So I started open source just over 20 years ago uh, with a project called Aspect J, which is a programming language. I looked after the programming language and its evolution and the compiler and the, and the tools that went with it. Um, and then for many years, I was the CTO at Spring Source. So we did the Spring Framework, and I guess latterly Spring Boot could be more known as. And um, we created lines of business around that. And actually, over time, many of the popular open source projects of the day like RabbitMQ and Redis and Apache itself and Apache Tomcat, etc. cetera. Um, and then through VMware and Pivotal, um, 
still working with open source. I uh, actually created the Cloud Foundry Foundation. I helped to create that. So I sort of done that side of things as well. Um, and then for the last seven, eight years with Excel, I kind of flipped, flipped over to the other side and I've been you know, helping to invest in, in startups. So in many of which um, are open source through and through, I have some open source element to their strategy. And I've very much enjoyed working with those companies and helping them on their journeys. That's great. I, I mean, thanks. Thanks for the background. I think um, that actually leads me probably to the first question, which I'll, I'll pose to you, Adrian. And in your experience of investing in a variety of different companies, it sounds like some of which are open source, some of which are not. Are there any differences in, in raising for an open source or an open technology business in comparison to a proprietary one? Or fundamentally, is there no difference? Do you want to? Yeah, kind I of mean, I, I would say that at, at the high level, it's it's really kind of the same. So there are some nuances we can get to those, but at the high level, it's really it's really pretty similar. And if I keep it really sort of straightforward, like it's what's the team behind this, you know, project or product? You know, so and is that a team that we can back? What's the market that they're going for? And are there any metrics that we can sort of see the evidence and belief? And, and like it really really in a nutshell, those would be three things we'd look at, like whether it's closed source, open source, whatever. Um, Obviously, like there are there are some nuances and differences with open source business, and so you know, sort of, um, we might look at the strength of the community and how well that's growing, and that that could be a good source of evidence ahead of, for example, monetization, and that that would be a real positive. You know, we'd love to see that. Um, we would probably want to to see and understand, and maybe get into this later, like sort of where is going to be the line between what's open and what is going to be commercial, and sort of how well understood is that, and where is your thinking on it, even if you haven't got there yet? And obviously it, it, it depends what round and stage of investment we're looking at, sort of how developed we expect all those things to be. But, you know, fundamentally at the end of the day, the question remains, can this be a, you know, a big business and does this look like it would be a good investment? And, you know, the fact that there's open source in the mix can, can help to provide some evidence for that, but um, it still needs to be a good business at the end of the day. Thanks, Adrian. And Leanne, in your experience of, of raising have you have you found it have you found adrian's sort of comments there to ring true or have, we, have you had difficulty in you know helping to educate potential investors about open source or particularly blockchain for example yeah look i'm getting to celebrate my 50 young this year and so 25 years sitting on a keyboard and um, certainly can tell you that the time now is a far better environment to raise capital with open source backing um, than 20 years ago, let alone even five or 10 years ago. So I think sort of paralleling in, yes, the fundamentals of the team, the timing, you know, the business model, et cetera, is definitely clear, but it just feels as though there's a lot more understood than where it was in sort of 1996 when we're all trying to, you know, ramp through after SCO Unix platforms and, you know, all of this sudden this thing called Linux popped up. Um, so my parallel comments is, it's a buoyant market, you know, people have an understanding that just because it's open source doesn't mean that it's um, free or a gift uh, to a certain extent and it, it doesn't mean that it's unsafe. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of education that's actually happened over the course of the last sort of 10 and 20 years. And uh, thanks, Leanne. And Henry, have you noticed uh, more adoption of open source technology in the stable of organisations that you work with? And and and, ha and what percentage of those are actually taking funding at, at this at this point? What, what's your perspective on it from 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 the companies, organisations that you're working with? Um, so, so 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 you know, open source is you know is, is a huge component of it. Um, but you know, I think we have to be careful when we just say open source because that, that, that that's a very broad term, and and as we'll probably get into the whole range of attributes that contribute to a company that says we're in open source um you know everything from well we we stuck up a version of our source and anyone who wants to look at it but there is zero community <laughs> which unfortunately a lot of people do that and think they're an open source company and and at one level they are but they're not in the in the in my, in my definition of what a real open source company is about um so the other end where you know, it's all about community and so forth. And so, um, which I think is a much more interesting end, um, but th that blend is obviously right. And, and I echo the comments about, at some point you've got to decide how you're going to monetize it and, and, and where, where's the line between, you know, stuff that might be closed that sits on top of it and somehow or whatever. Um, and the other dimension is whether you're building a platform or just a, pro a vertical product. And again, that has huge connotations about what it means to be an open source company that's trying to build that thing. Uh, what I do see is um, 
you know, you know, when we're looking at companies that we're going to partner with, we look at, you know, even though we may not be investing, for instance, or, or I guess we do sometimes, but in general, we're not, but, but that community is equally important and that team is equally important. Um, and when we're looking at, you know, fast growing startups and ISVs who I think are going to be the big, you know, the, the, the household names three, four, five years from now, it's exactly those criteria. Um, I, I think many companies do recognize the advantages of having, of, of using open source technologies because, you know, fundamentally, if the person supplying it screws up, they can find someone else who can do a better job without having to rip everything out. And, and that is still an incredibly powerful motivator for the large clients we see and every large client we work with, and IBM itself for that matter, uh, you know, nearly everything we do is now open source. Nearly everything we do is now open source, either using it, contributing it, um, or partnering with it. And so it, it's a total sea change in the last 10 years. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It's almost becoming indistinguishable in the infrastructure space. The yeah. open source is computer infrastructure. Yeah. In I, mean, yeah. I mean, you may, if you find something is closed and it's in infrastructure, what the hell is that? You know, I mean, it's all, <laughs> not quite that, but it's close to that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sam, obviously, you've just been through through a process of, of raising um, uh, capital around an open source business. How much of the actual open source, your open source credentials, or the fact that you're actually using open source technology, was was included in the various pitches that you were giving? And and uh, did you get get grilled on that by particular investors, or were you were you actually picking investors that you would be respect, receptive to? How how were you thinking about that? It's a great question. Um, I think in general. I, the first thing was we had a game plan of the kinds of investors we wanted to approach. Um, I think, you know, th there's no shortage of venture capital out there, uh, or, or at least firms that are venture capitalists to approach out there, but finding ones that have expertise in what you are doing, uh, at least broadly speaking. And, and so it could be around open source, it could be around infrastructure, it could be around, you know, whatever your particular product is, I would shortlist that and that's what we had done. Um, and so when it came down to it, we didn't have to explain the value of open source to anyone. Everybody was very aware uh what the value is the questions are more around how we wanted to approach the go-to-market how we might think about the definition of our open source open core stuff versus our closed source or enterprise type offering how we might monetize over time what those kinds of channels might look like how we might engage a community around the product um, all of those were, were far more important to the, the venture capitalists and there were around the, the sort of question of should we be open source or should we be proprietary? I guess th some of those questions kind of probably suggest open source as a, as a market, as, or, or as a concept has kind of grown in some maturity <laughs> at this point. Um, because obviously I, from my perspective, when I started speaking about open source, when I was looking at starting Jetstack, I didn't really get much of a, a, um, uh, you know, a response <laughs> on that. Uh, do, do, do investors have a particular opinion on how, how the business mo model should be structured around open source, or is that like a continually evolving, evolving subject? Because I feel like we're seeing a lot of different ways to monetize open source at this point. Um, Adrian, do you want to talk a bit about whether there is a, a particular model that works. Yeah, in the, uh, I, I, I don't think there is one true way. Um, you know, so even, even sort of, you know, 10 years ago, there's a variety of like different open source communities we were in and making sort of businesses around them. Each community each project had its own slight different bias and feel and, and you had to work with that. Um, so I mean, there, there are a bunch of sort of common patterns that people use that you could look to. Um, but yeah, there's definitely not one true. I mean, what one that you know Sam mentioned is kind of like there's a there's a core open source project, and then there's some kind of um, enterprise extension. Another classic one is kind of like um, everything to do with operating and managing it might be commercial, but the the basic functionality is free. That's a variation on open core, but a really common split. Um, one that you know, works really well. It wasn't an option back in the day when when we were running one of this bit like you have. An open source project and then you run a SaaS version of it and that's that's probably the most common and easiest way to monetize open source today to be honest with you um and then you've got you know just like classes like services training support etc um which on their own probably wouldn't be enough to really get at most vcs excited but in a, in a blend with some of the other stuff they can really have an important role so. actually adrian i've got a question for that i mean I, I totally agree with all that, and, I, and, I, and those splits, I think, are the, the driving force. How you do that? 
but there's been a lot of talk about various fangly new license types and, and that's a way of sort of you know we get to use it for free for a bit yeah. and anyway, what's, what's your view on those i mean uh, you know, you know if... yeah i know that that's a, that is a really interesting one isn't it and um i don't get religious about any of these open source things so i take a fairly pragmatic view um i think for me that there's a more general rule that um i i've found to be true which is uh, you basically you've got to be really clear about what is going to be open source and what's going to be commercial and you need to understand that and users need to understand that and allied to that um once you get something you can't take it away. however however rational it feels to withdraw something like anytime you try and like retrench from a position you've always been in there's always trouble, I, you know, and we, I have some scars on my back from some things that Spring Source we did that we thought were completely reasonable, um, but, you know, that they, they were a takeaway something we previously given, and, you know, it, it was really brutal. Uh, so you know, that, those would be my two guiding lines, and I think, in all honesty, if you set out the project up front with a certain license and say, this is what we've chosen and this is how it works, everybody has had this, and you know, a variety can be fine, and people can opt in or not as they wish. Um, it's when you get like this community has been wedded to this, we've been using it for years, and now the rules feel like they've switched on me. That's when I think the troubles come. I, yeah, I mean, I've I've seen examples of that as well. I mean, I've I mean, I've I've I've, I've been burnt um, representing various projects where that's been the case. And I mean, do, do, thinking about the position of a potential founder in the open source space, do you feel like they need to have these models? nailed in advance of going to the investors or do you think that in some cases those business models can evolve over time i mean the nature of open source means that it's always changing and there may be new models that that that, that you probably didn't even realize that you could monetize at some point at some point in your business <laughs> might develop um, leanne did, did you go to your investors with a very set pattern as to how you were going to monetize um or or, or or has that evolved over time Look, I think the assurity of business models and return revenue rates is really around the, the, the age of maturity and the uplift of what you're raising at and at what time. And investors, of course, will come in with a certain view as to where they believe the business should be, um, should be at. Um, certainly, the really big emergent space at the moment is this sort of crossover with the likes of blockchain technology in the crypto space with NFTs, where you know, what is that business model? And, and, and there are a number of sort of, you know, startup founders where typically it was being about what's the MVP, what's the MVP, what's the MVP? And now it's the MVP and the MVC, the minimum viable community, community and the MVP in terms of product. Um, and that still for me is the very first conversation sense that we get from investors. Um, and the second is, okay, now that you've understood how you're gonna bring a utility to market effectively, of which a community can be built around in both utilization and contribution. Um, now, what's the business model? What's the tokenization and the share of value? Um, but I've found that the traditional questions of venture capital are still being posed in the first instance. Um, and then again, depending on where they're at in the funding round is the, the scrutiny of the business model, the revenue, the types of planning that you need to do both around the product and around the, the, business, um, the business typology. That's yeah, that's really really interesting um, perspective there. Thanks for that. So, uh, Sam, there's a question. The question here for you from Anne, um, and and that and that actually comes down to some of the uh, the questions that that I have prepared, and that is, how do you actually go about finding a, a possible VC that that might be interested in investing? Like, where where like, did you have to did you have to spend a lot of time just just trying to identify those people, or, or were they were they easily apparent from from your from a, from a quick Google search? <laughs> Um, they, they are relatively apparent. They, they can be found. I think you can, um, they, there's a smarter way to go about it though. Right? And, um, and so for us, it was look at companies we admired in, in the space similar to ours, go to somewhere like a crunch base, type in the company name, get an idea of the funding that these companies have done, who their investors are go through to the investor website, 99% of them do list their portfolio uh, investments on the website, click in and just get a feel for, okay, beyond this one company that we admired, what else is the rest of the portfolio like? And there, 
are, you know, the, there's the premier league of venture capitalists. If you are following tech and you read the tech news, et cetera, you'll start to hear the same names over and over and over again. So immediately you probably already have a short list there, but I think around sort of thinking about your space and thinking about which investors have experience in your space. Uh, and then basically going from there, I would say that the, the, the extra bonus step you could do here. I mean, most VCs on their website will have a contact us or pitch us type link and you can go through that. It's from, from my perspective, much, much better to get a warm introduction to somebody. And so if you can take the name of the venture capitalist you're looking at, put it into LinkedIn, see how many degrees of separation you have between a partner or somebody you might know through somebody who's working at a VC and try and get that connection made, it's going to happen a lot faster for you to get the kinds of conversations you need to have. Um, I would say that for us, I mean, all in, you, you, and by the way, you're going to read articles online, how we raised X million dollars in two days, you know, that the, those kinds of articles. They're there for clickbait. I mean, some people are going to do it in two days. Normally, they've got a really good relationship already with a, a VC. But if you're coming in cold, expect rejection. Expect it's going to take multiple weeks. Uh, I think for us, it was four to six weeks, which is still a relatively swift raise at the end of the day. But you know, it just depends you, your situation, who you know. If you follow that basic principle of like stick with people in your in your sort of category figure out who they are and figure out how to get introduced you'll be much more successful i noticed that the question specifically mentions vcs but i mean does it have to be vcs i've, I've i noticed leanne from from some of the, the backers that you have and, and henry your comment on the fact that ibm sometimes invests in partners it doesn't actually just have to be vcs does do, do either of you have any perspective on whether you took a slightly different approach or a, an alternative way of looking at, at, source of, at sources of capital? Um, so I, I'll sort of answer your question sideways, if you like, which is I think this is actually a broader, um, and I think Amanda just posted something in the chat related to this, which is one of the things I think uh, invest, you know, um, founders, uh, whether the right at the start or as they're growing, you know, and the, and the ones that we haven't done traditionally as well in the UK as perhaps in the Valley and other places is build the mentorship around you as founders and growing. You know, we now do have quite a good collection of people who've done this before, been there, are interested in making sure we have a, a, an increasingly vibrant um, startup investor community within the UK. Um, and you know reach out I mean, to some point reach out to those people find the connections it may be you know and, and we've always had this idea of you know advisory boards and so forth the sort of advisory boards that people traditionally have built doesn't include this kind of stuff but it should you know and, you know and i think doing that early is incredibly beneficial because then you do get a potential introductions you do get uh, the ability to build your understanding of what you know, where you might fit in the open source model, you know, and, and get, you know, uh, I don't mean this, you know, and, and gain as much information as you can from the people around you. Don't be afraid to reach out. Many people will do this because they want to see a growing community. I mean, I enter a bunch of, you know, CTOs. You no, know, it's not for money. It's to, because you want to make sure that we have a growing community. That just rises the tide, you know, rises the tide for everyone. Um, and there are a bunch of people out there who will help you do that. And so, you know, I would encourage people to look at that. And they may connect you with, you know, obviously there's angel funding and so forth. I mean, that's that's an interesting area, which is probably more fraught with problems, actually, I suspect, than the general VC community, in my opinion, just because it's all over the map in terms of the angel uh, space, um, especially a seed fund. You know, what is a seed funding now, as you said, Sam, is, is what you might... I've called a series B about you know 10, 15 years ago. So the, the amount of money is radically different. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, sort of answering the question. Now. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's, that's very, um, Adrian, how, how would how would someone get in front of you? Yeah, I, I was gonna say that well, one thing to add maybe to the previous conversation is you know, don't don't be shy about sort of reaching out to even even ahead of the raise, like we would often be talking to a founding team you know, on and off, maybe for a year or more comfortably before that, you know, there's actually a round that 
crystallizes that that we invest in. So you know, to build, building that relationship, so uh, as Sam said, so it's there at the time you want to raise is important. Um, and you know, very, very similar advice, like as you can imagine, like a firm like Axel gets a lot of cold inbound. Um, and you know, we do look at it; it can work, but it's not the best way. You know, the, the best way is to come in with a with a warm introduction through the network. Um, so it could be another founder that's in our portfolio. It could be actually sort of like one of the, you know, a seed firm or an angel or something that says, hey, I'm working with this great company. You should take a look. Yeah, that, that, that's always good. Um, and if you, if you are going to kind of come in cold, um, like there's a, there's a difference, I think, between like, you know, hey, we, so we looked at your pro, you know, portfolio. We see you're investing in these companies. We think we're doing something similar. We'd love to talk to you. Then just like the cold kind of, we're raising money, you know, here's, here's my link, book a, book, a, book a meeting on my Calendly, kind of, you know, the, and you get these kind of two extremes and, and you can kind of guess which ones are, are more effective. But, you know, on the, on, the, so on the VC side of the fence, you know, we, we get a lot of inbound. We, we take, you know, a thousand plus meetings a year. We might make, to give you order of magnificent, like, we might make 10 investments, you know, so um, you, you've got to find a way to stand out from the noise. And, Thanks, Adrian. And, and Leanne, any advice for you for, for people looking for funding? What works yeah, for you? Yeah, certainly for us, it was about sort of smart and strategic money. That suggests that VCs is, is the opposite to that. But the prime example is Tencent, one of our lead investors um, for our Series A. I mean, they approached us three years prior to the, um, us saying yes. In fact, we, we originally said no, and we quickly said no, not yet. And, and the reason why we said no, not yet is because we understood um, they were enabling access to market. Extreme engineering is one of their very core strengths and we weren't ready for them. You know, our engineering team, our senior um, engineers were, were busy down the rabbit hole and we needed to be ready for what they would give just beyond the signing of a check. Having a fat bank balance is one thing, but the ability then to leverage and execute on it is really where the value is created. And particularly when you're... Um, when your customer base straddles into the global south so countries like india china you know africa south america you know there is definitely the right timing in the type of money that you might sort of bring in and those strategic investments beyond the vcs are actually the most powerful way to anchor that corner piece of the puzzle which i think is pretty important must be nice when you've got people contacting you to try and give you money <laughs> and that's that's a good that's a good place to get to has anyone worked worked with or tried to start a business without taking funding in the open source space or has got any any ex experience on that i uh, know you have Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I, I, yeah so it all started that way too yeah we, we didn't take vc money until sometime down the journey interesting yeah i mean adrian do you want to maybe just talk a bit about your experience there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think maybe in the kind of, it is, it is important to say like, you know, sort of taking VC funding is a choice and you do it at some point in your journey, but it's not the only way to get funding. And particularly with, you know, certain kinds of open source projects that have a large community, et cetera, um, the, the way that sort of Spring Source was bootstrapped was it started uh, with the classic kind of consultancy. You know, so sort of people were out trying to build apps on top of Spring, they wanted some help. We, we could do consultancy, um, you know, we decided for us, and I think this is an important distinction to do like the short duration, high value consulting, not project delivery, so that we could still focus on building kind of our core open source product. But uh, we did that, that brought in some money. Um, and then we stepped it up and we released a bunch of training, which is another really good sort of way early on to bring in revenue. Um, it's, it's a little bit more person effective because you've got one trainer and you've got a whole audience. Um, both of those things, by the way, like you might see that VCs sort of look down on those revenue sources because they're not the classic ones, but they can be really strategically valued. A, they can get you early money. And B, um, for us, they put you in a tight feedback loop with your own users. You get to really see like what's working, what's not working, what are they struggling with, uh, which, which early on, again, is fantastic. Um, and so, you know, we use some of those sort of bootstrapping mechanisms. And I guess in modern parlance, I mean, I don't think this existed back then, but you know, we also about sort of product market fit in the startup world. Let's say that helps you get towards project market fit. You know, you, you've got an open source project that's working with the community and things are moving. And, you know, maybe at the time you come to say, right, you know, now we, 
we understand what our commercialization strategy is going to be. We've got some early proof that that's going to go. Now we want to grow it a little bit. That would be a classic time for a number of reasons where we can come back to why you might say, okay, now I want to bring some money in uh, to be able to do that. And maybe that would be a classic kind of first venture round time. Yeah, so lots of, lots of, um, of your, your uh, sort of answer there that I resonated with. And for me personally, obviously, as Sam alluded to, I, I decided not to take funding um, with, with, with my business partner. Um, we decided that obviously the space that we were moving into at the time it was Kubernetes was so new that I think if we took investment, we might end up painting ourselves into a corner with a particular product or approach that might actually a bit later down the line, maybe not work, work out. So we wanted to actually stay close to our customers and learn from them with the consulting and the services and the training to actually identify the gap to then look at maybe taking investment. It got to a point for us five, five years down the line where we realized that we needed to take investment um, to sort of build out that product strategy because we found it very difficult to run both a service business and an engineer. Yeah, yeah that's so, tough, yeah. I don't know if you found that, Adrian. Of, of course, absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's one of the real challenges early on there where you, you know, it's like the, the best people to do the high value consultancy and deliver really great trainings are your main contributors, right? And, and obviously you want to be building out the project and you want to be doing that and it is a drain. And, and that's one of the triggers again for us. We took funding because um, we couldn't keep growing with, with that constraint on the core team. And, yeah. and so we wanted to alleviate some of that. So absolutely, that, that's a real consideration down the line, you know, just, I guess, sort of today, there's a little bit of a, a, a feeling, you know, it's like, oh, you started a company, great, go and do a big round, you know, like immediately. And sometimes that is the right thing to do, and you can do it, but, you know, so it doesn't have to be, there are other ways, and, you know, sort of, to, to get going early on, that it's worth thinking about having in the mix. Absolutely. There's a question here from uh, Massey, and this is, a, I guess, a, a question about business models around open technology or open source that have have not been a success, that were successful. Or, or, so has anyone seen any any sort of um, examples of like models that just haven't worked or any, any models that it might be worth <laughs> trying to avoid when you're starting an open technology business? Well, I, I guess one obvious one is, is you know, big, overly simplistic, right? Free community, and, and I think, um, I can't remember who, who mentioned it earlier, actually, is that, um, uh, you know, everything looks free, and then suddenly, overnight, you throw some magic switch, and, you know, everyone has to register, and everyone has to give up the details. Of the, I mean, it's just like, you know, they, they, they kind of simplistic model, we got them on the hook now, you know, and, and so now we're just going to harvest it. And, and, and I, I know that sounds simplistic, you think, well, no one would do that. <laughs> well, believe me, people do do that. Um, and it's incredibly damaging. Uh, and, you know, usually you'll go down in flames um, when you try that. So, you know, having a business model that says, hook them when it's free and then just slap a, some kind of monetization on everyone with that later on, we won't tell them up front that's what's going to happen is usually a recipe for disaster. I think that's, a, yeah, that's a great point. I don't, I don't think any potential founder should be under the false assumption that a user of your open source project is automatically monetizable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to, you know, you have to, and, and Adrian made, made some really good points earlier about, you know, in terms of how do you construct the various layers and, and you know, and try and be as upfront as possible about how, you know, you know, you may not know at the start, of course, but, you know, keep true to your ethos and, and, and you know, if you start that where this bit is free, know that that better always better be free <laughs> or, or, or community-based and, and allow people to contribute to and so forth and be very open about it. Mm -hmm. And if you do think they're going to monitor it later, then make sure that those bits are kept out of the, um, the community until you're ready to, 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 to bring those in. Otherwise, you'll just confuse everyone. Absolutely. I think another thing just to, to, to bear in mind as well is that often the persona of the person that's consuming your open source project might not necessarily be the persona that you're going to sell your product to so you have to kind of bear in mind that you might be selling to a very different person um in the business perhaps that, that otherwise didn't adopt your technology but is there looking at it thinking how am i going to organize this how am i going to make it consistent how am i going to control it across multiple clouds and so on and so forth so think a lot i'd say there about um about the personas of the people that are going to be buying and consuming possibly the, the value add on top of the open source project sam do you have anything to add in and around this um, I mean, I think there's plenty of prior art out there. So in terms of sort of like business models, I wouldn't 
you don't need to go and invent a new business model for open source, right? Look at the, the best performing open source companies out there and what they've done to date. And it's, you know, some kind of subscription to either a SaaS service or uh, there's an open core version of the product that is then built with proprietary or paid for features on top of. Figure out how that maps to what you are doing. And um, I think just be careful from the get-go is don't, don't, don't go out there with no clear idea because you may end up in the point where you have to think about retracting things out from the open source community. And as we said, it's it, it's doable, but it's a little messy and it's fraught with peril for your community. And there's plenty of examples out there of the big open source giants that have done it. And, and you can go and Google and look at the articles and the, and the backlash that happened from when they did that. Um, I think just to, on the previous question, I, was, I think a point worth adding around um, whether to raise or whether to bootstrap and, and um, how, I, how we thought about it was for us, it, the decision to raise from venture capitalists, we also had angel investors. Some of the best introductions to venture capital came from our angel investors. And so I definitely say a great source of knowledge, a great source of network, a great way to practice your pitch is in front of angel investors before you go to the institutional venture capitalists. And for us, it was more than just money. Um, we actually, what you get with a really solid partner, and this is kind of back to my point around finding a VC who has experience in your space, is they're going to have skills and experiences around what works, what doesn't work, even from a business model perspective, how you should be thinking about your go-to-market, uh, intros to potential hires, intros to potential customers. Um, and, and for us, taking the cash gave us more options than just being able to survive without revenue. It was also to get us spooled up quicker with all those other things. It allowed us to actually build a community around the product without having be distracted by trying to find revenue. And it also allowed us to, to ignore the wrong kinds of revenue. We're, we're very focused on the kinds of revenue we wanted to get and not get pulled into a particular deal where somebody's asking something of the product that we feel like we have to do because we need the revenue, we actually don't need that anymore. We can go focus on building what it is we think we should be building, engaging with the community to get the right signs, really achieve project and product market fit without being stressed about not having cash in the bank. I think you make a very compelling case there, Sam. Maybe the next business I start will be with <laughs> so Thanks for that. Um, I, one, I, I was at an event last week and someone uh, I know quite well made quite a provocative statement, I thought, and that was, I don't see there's going to be a very successful open technology or open software, um, you know, unicorn I, over the next five years because it's been so massively disrupted by the cloud vendors and, you know, like the cloud vendors are just going to end up hoovering all this up and providing it as a service. And which, you know, I, I, you, I don't know whether I would disagree agree or not, but does anyone have any, um, any sort of uh, perspective on investing in a com sorry, taking investment for a company where you might end up competing against the cloud vendors and, and anything that you should be thinking about with regards to that? It definitely, it was, it was something kind of that was, that was on my mind maybe five years ago. I was like, oh, this, this, looks, this looks kind of challenging. Um, I think we've seen a couple of things. I mean, you know, one, some sort of spectacular instances where that instinct has proved to be wrong. And one that comes to mind, for example, might be Snowflake. You know where you'd say, what, "What do you mean you're, you're going to go build a data warehouse and you're going to sit right on AWS against kind of like all of the the big cloud kind of you know data warehousing stuff that you think would be bread and butter for them?" And yet they've built a fantastic business, um, and and I think that's doable. And I think you know anything that you have a really tight integration with the community and a great ease of use and a great feature on that side from a developer and user perspective. Um, the cloud platforms are comparatively weak compared to what you see startups being able to do. We've also seen, um, I think now, like the, the multi-cloud hybrid cloud thing is actually real and there is value in something that is going to work across you know, a number of different clouds. You know, I, mean, I guess the whole Kubernetes ecosystem is a good example of that, right? That, that's come up and has value partially because you can do this moving. So, um, so that, that's, that's been real too. Um, 
Yeah, I, th I think it can be done. I mean, obviously, you've got to be aware of um, exactly what you're going up against. But as long as you've got reasons to believe you can win and you've thought that through, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a showstopper or it can't be done not at all. Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, this is exactly the thesis we, we, we're building plural off of, which is, um, you know, in, in a way, there's too much control with the cloud providers now, and people are actually looking to, to, to bring that control back to them, not to say the cloud providers are ever going to go away. It's they have a managed service catalog, that catalog is broad, but of mixed quality. And people are looking to say, look, I want to use the best pieces of technology I can, deploy them where I think makes sense. In some cases, it may be cloud. In some cases, it's it's hybrid or it's on-prem. In some cases, I'm using an AWS service, a Google service. I'm building the service because those don't need what I need, uh, what I, I want to do. And, and so th that's kind of our thesis is around we're going to see a lot more multi-cloud movement. We're going to see a lot more people who want full control and transparency over the services they deploy, and they don't want to be squeezed on the margins for doing it. And that was... You know, in my previous role as the head of product, one of the things we saw most often was our cloud bill was astronomical. We, we weren't actually realizing the savings we thought we might get from moving into the cloud full force. And so we actually started not to fully repatriate things, but to cherry pick the right things to bring back in and for us to own. And, and so that's the thesis we built Plural on as a platform. And um, yeah, they, I mean, obviously, that I, in my personal perspective, I think that's where we're headed, and that's uh, there's a big market there for that. I guess I ought to comment as I work for a cloud provider, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually agree, actually, um, and I think, I mean, you know, you know, you, you know why, why do I been by Red Hat and 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 all this because and our whole approach has become one of this hybrid cloud. The fact that you know the stuff that that, that the big cloud providers can do well is the scale and the depth and sort of, but you know, we've all, well, certainly we've learned is that, you know, tying people to a, to a given cloud or, or not letting them do that kind of distributed bit where, you know, you know, um, you know, I guess our ethos is you decide where you want to run it and, and we'll help you do that. It, it, that's kind of where we, I think IBM's evolved to from, hey, we're going to build an IBM cloud, which we have and, and you know, and should everyone go run on that? That's not at all what we think actually anymore, um, which is, you know, how is it that, you know that you know that we can enable people to distribute their stuff where it makes sense to, and I think that's where the cloud providers will have to go um, because that is what either you come very niche about a, in a particular market where you dominate for a given cloud reason, or you have to provide that flexibility. And so, uh, I actually strongly support both those statements about you can absolutely you shouldn't be afraid of the cloud providers. Um, understand what they're good at and what they're not good at, and the fact that in the end, you're selling to a customer who needs to be able to deploy their service and execute their service wherever their business forces them to have their data or computer, whatever it happens to be that you're solving. And, and, and if you can be flexible and ensure that they're not constrained, then you'll be very valuable to them. Mm -hmm. Leanne, does the cloud affect your business at all? Or are there, are there any other sort of like larger competitors that might affect you know, what you're doing with your products and open source. I mean, I, I just look at it from a perspective of IPFS and, and, you know, where that is heading, particularly with distributed, you know, network layering, layer one and layer two are coming now incredibly strong. Forget the crypto bros on one side, but, you know, the fundamentals of the infrastructure that drives that economy, the metaverse, et cetera, but that fundamental element in the engine is not going to be provided um, on the infrastructure that the cloud hosts have today. It's going to be, it's going to be the rise and the surgence from um, the likes of distributed ledger technologies, IPFS, all of these new protocols that are coming into play. So I'd say the freight train's coming, IBM, put two hands on the steering wheel and prepare the airbag. <laughs> and I can say that because I'm on the blockchain board of advisors yeah. for IBM. So, sure, you know. exactly. But I, mean, but I think, I think, you're, I mean, I think, I mean, people, you know, I think cloud companies do exactly have to understand that that's what's happening. I, I agree with you, actually. I mean, you know, and, and, and it's about, you know, you have to think about you know what is it you're trying to facilitate as a cloud as a cloud provider and and, and it's not 
hey, you're just, just we're going to have this one massive cloud and everyone's going to use it. That's just, that, that just, that just, you know, that just yeah, doesn't yeah, fly. Absolutely not. And we're starting to, I mean, I'm, I'm starting to see changes from the, from the vendors themselves with products like, for example, EKS Anywhere by Amazon, where it's enabling uh, their Kubernetes service in on-premise environments. We've got Anthos by Google doing the same thing. We've got Microsoft with Arc. And, uh, and so, yeah, this, we're starting to see, I mean, obviously it's a bit different here in, in IBM's case, because you've got Red Hat and you've got OpenShift, I'm assuming. So I don't know, you're probably thinking from that perspective, obviously VMware with, VMware with Tanzu, but we're, starting, we're moving into this, this world where you have this sort of, this, this stack that will be portable. And I think even the cloud vendors are recognizing it's going to be, become a multi-cloud world. So that's, um, yeah, that's, that, that's what I'm seeing. Um, I, I, I don't want to miss any of the questions that we've got in the chat, but I, I, one came in early on, I think actually from Amanda herself, was around the importance of IP and who, who, all, who, who holds that and what, whether they should be putting patents in place or like doing, doing anything around their trademarks. Does anyone have a perspective or some advice that they can give around that? I can jump in if you like. Um, so, I mean, I see we're, we're interested in um, some signs of defensibility. Uh, but that, that could come from many different ways. It could be um, in your interaction with the community, it could be a deep e ecosystem integrations and, and a large bench of those that's very hard to reproduce. Um, it could be like your core technology approach. Um, generally, I found when, when entrepreneurs come in and they're excited about their patents, they're more excited about the patents than we are. You know, like, all, all the other all the other stuff to do with like, have you got a great business idea? Is it is this working? Is it moving? What, you know, how you know what, what's the model here, and how can we understand it? And uh, you know, the patents are nice, um, but they're definitely not necessary, and you know, they're actually pretty expensive for you know because it, it's great to protect your core IP, and, and I don't want to discourage somebody from doing that if, if they really realize that this is a key thing and this is like yeah, absolutely central, but. It's not necessary for raising to have a, to have a patent portfolio. I'd say most companies we see don't. That's good to hear. That is good to hear. Yeah. I, mean, um, I mean, I think I mean we've talked, Adrian. You and I have talked about this before. Is that in the end, it's about execution. I mean, you know, you know, you know, and, you know, and, you know. Can you defend your that your execution is going to be better than others? You yeah. Know, and, and 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 by whatever mechanism, and, and you know, and yeah. which points of the team, and understanding how you're going to progress, and you know. And, Far mm. more than yeah, we've got you know our, our lawyers have drafted these three patents. We think are the best things since sliced bread, which you know. Yeah, I see, uh, that's a really good working at it, and maybe like, but I think it's good one for this audience to understand because when you're running an open source business, often the found an under market, um, and so I try and sort of as a calibrator, like the figuring out your go to market is about equally as hard as building overweight on the tech and underweight on the commercialism and marketing. So to really look at the, uh, at the go to market, uh, as much as you do probably the tech, which actually brings me on to a really like good, good next question for people maybe watching this and thinking about starting a business, what type of skills should they be trying to develop in comparison, perhaps to, to starting a, pro a proprietary uh, business? Um, Leanne, do you have any advice for aspiring? entrepreneurs and, and the types of skills that they should be developing if they're thinking about an open technology business? The, 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 hard, the hardest skill is emotional intelligence and people skills. I mean, certainly lock me in a room with a keyboard for a number of hours and I didn't have to talk to anyone and be perfectly happy. But, you know, no business is built just on a single person. Uh, and and I'm, I just, I'm the sole founder. So, you know, there is, there is no founding team um, per se that I can lean upon, but I do have to create an environment where those sort of early early engaged employees are the right mix the skill set mix to what i hold and then there's got to be a willingness over time to look at yourself in the mirror and recognize where your complete weaknesses are and you, either you need to enter into an you know an evergreen ever learning environment um, or just hire the very best that you can to be able to complement you um, where you're where you're most weak so i would definitely say just you know understanding your own vulnerabilities um, maximize on the absolute power strength that you hold, whether that's technical or, or otherwise. And then um, you've got to harness uh, people skills and emotional intelligence to make this thing work. Because you can employ really good economists, good accountants, but <laughs> unless you're good at people, you're in real trouble. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I think when I think back through the seven or eight years of running Jetstack, it's the individuals and the impact they've had 
like when we've hired them at the right time for the right things that have made the biggest difference. So I'm totally with you on that, uh, Leanne. And, and Sam, what do you think uh, an aspiring entrepreneur should be, what skills should they be trying to develop in, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think the, um, the f for me at least, is open source generally, the, the way an open source project may start, it, it, like most organically, is an engineer scratching their own itch. Um, there's a problem they're encountering, they put something out there to solve that problem, and it generally will start to spool a bit of traction if it is indeed solving a problem for many people. And so with that in mind, like most open source founders I see or meet tend to be a little more technical in nature. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't be successful in open source. And I think finding as Leanne said, somebody to complement the skill set that you have a deficit in. If you are not so technical, look for somebody early or a co-founder early to fill that technical gap. If you are technical, look for somebody who can help maybe on the more business go to market side of things. If you have both, amazing. Um, for, for the sort of like first emergence of where you might go as a business in open source is you know, like if you think about proprietary stuff, it, it's really like a lot of sales and marketing to get out there and get the product out there and get people to buy the product. For open source, actually not so much. It's a lot of engineering work. Some of that comes from the community. You are driving the majority of that early. And then you're building a community around that. And so having somebody who can create engagement in the community, create interesting discussions, thought content, uh, webinars, bring people together in a meetup, talk tech, talk business problems, but ultimately like create engagement from people around what you are doing. That's probably the initial step you're going to take in an open source business. And so finding people to, to go and grow that community, I think early, and I, I think Leanne covered it again, is like being a people person in open source or having someone to engage people in an open source business is really important. Or, do, or, or to develop the skills to do it yourself, perhaps. Correct, yeah. And, and actually, um, you reminded me of a, a friend of mine who's an invest, investor, and he will not invest in a company where there is not a technical person and a commercial person. He's made that as a, as a hard line for himself that he will not invest in a company without those two. So that's, that's definitely um, something to, uh, to sort of bear in mind. Uh, with only a couple of minutes left, Henry. What what advice would you you give to aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, well, well, so I, I echo what was said earlier, and and you know I think one this idea of community. I mean, we talked about you know uh, your very first question was actually you know is there a difference between you know proprietary and non proprietary? The idea that you're going to have to build a community and you'll need the skill sets in your team to build that community is probably one of the defining differences between those two those two business models. So it is really important that you ensure you have a team of people that covers those bases and, and hats off to Leanne for trying to do it as a sole founder, fantastic. Um, but, you know, and, and so the other skill I think you should try and do is that kind of, you know, being able to look in the mirror and understand what are your core skills and what are the ones that you need to augment with the people around you? Being able to do that is just unbelievably bad. It's unfortunately not an easy thing to do and, and whatever builds it, whatever walk of life you're in, it's just a really hard thing to do because we always like to think we're all great at everything. Um, and of course, we're not. So, so, so that, that's the other thing I would really encourage people to try and be as honest as you can. You know, if you've got a trusted advisor or mentor, ask them that question. You know, so what do you think yeah. I'm good at? And what, and what do I need help with? And, and if they're honest about it, that's incredibly valuable. Because then you can take that into your raise and the discussions with VCs or whoever you, and build the right team, which will make them far more investable and far, fundamentally far more successful. Yeah, and in my particular case, a lot of that learning was done by trial and error. So try and avoid that and get the mentorships in place early so you can try and reflect on that. It, it, it saves uh, the bruises and yes, the, you know, the brick wall yeah. and stuff on the forehead and stuff, yeah, which is painful. Yeah. So. Uh, and Adrian, just as the, the final comment, what, 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 what would make you invest in a, in, a, in, a new, in a new company or a potential entrepreneur? What, what are the skills that really make you think, okay, this is the, this is the person I'm going to back? Yeah, I, I guess... Um, it's a combination of understanding the domain, um, ability to execute that Henry's touched on, and then, but then I want to come back to just what we've just been talking about, which is um, the ability to 
grow a strong team around them. So being an organizational builder, you know, like a lot of stuff is going to happen on this startup journey, pivots and twists and turns and all kinds of things that you can't predict. Uh, but the one thing you know is you're going on this journey with that team. And so like that actually that a lot of the startup journey is about like you used to do everything as like a, a sole founder, co-founder, and you're gradually letting go of responsibilities and building an organization. And um, so that skill of can you, can you recruit effectively? Have you got a good network? Can you onboard? Can you get an organization sort of working well? Um, that that's kind of like the, the super meta skill that makes everything else work over time. And so um, that would be some of the things that you know we would be really delighted to see in, in the founding team. Thanks for for that, Adrian. It's great to hear everyone seemingly having consistent advice there around building teams and and developing people and trying to to sort of um, dovetail against your strengths. So thank you very much to all the panelists for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you to the audience for joining us, and uh, I wish you all the best for your Friday afternoon. Next week, uh, Amanda's going to be talking uh, about um, some of the IP and legal issues around uh, starting an open source business, I believe. So uh, please tune in for that, and um, I wish you all the best. Thank you, everybody.